go and see if there's coffee in there, Bert. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you uh, for the invitation to uh, present uh, some of the work that we're doing with that uh, was part of the Energy Frontier Research Center that uh, DOE funded uh, the previous five years. Uh, the EFRC was not renewed, so. Uh, hearing a lot of the uh, the last of the uh, works uh, coming out uh, right now. So, uh, there we are. <laughs> I was seeing it here, I wasn't seeing it up there. So, uh, But uh, as uh, uh, Dan pointed out, this is a multi-institutional uh, uh, endeavor, and I'll give, try to give credit to everybody who uh, did uh, work uh, on this portion of the project here in a few minutes. Uh, as I probably do not need to uh, point out to uh, this group, okay, renewables uh, are going to be an important uh, aspect in the energy forecast uh, for the future. Uh, renewables uh, right now represent uh, somewhere around 10, 11 percent of the, uh, the total energy use uh, in, in the world uh, right now. And by 2040, uh, they're expected to uh, rise to somewhere around uh, uh, a quarter of the, uh, the total energy use in there. A lot of that will be wind and solar, but uh, much of that will be biomass, okay, which uh, there's a lot of interest in converting that biomass to uh, both uh, chemicals and uh, to, to fuels, okay, and by fuels we mean something besides just putting wood chips uh, into our uh, internal combustion engine, which doesn't seem to work uh, very well, so. Uh, but uh, these, uh, uh, the uh, bioprocessing uh, is biomaterials, uh, creates a lot of challenges uh, uh, for catalysts in the 21st century. It's not the same as uh, uh, treating resids or uh, other things that uh, we have done in the past for uh, uh, um, creating fuels from that. Okay, uh, one of the big uh, things is selectivity. Okay, that uh, in the past uh, we've mostly been interested in the uh, catalyst activity of uh, materials as long as we made some kind of gasoline and uh, distillate. Uh, from that, but uh, nowadays uh, we want to keep uh, the atom efficiency as uh, 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 high as possible, okay, it to, uh, the primary reason there is about 50% of the co uh, energy cost of uh, processing uh, nowadays uh, has to do with the, the separations. So if we can make one, uh, uh, one type of feed go to one type of product, we can cut down uh, significantly on the amount of capital involved in that. Another thing is uh, stability of the catalyst. Uh, again, many of these uh, catalysts were developed for the oil industry, okay, in which oil, uh, water is uh, significantly excluded from the feedstock. Water uh, in either a steam form or a liquid form is extremely corrosive uh, to catalysts and uh, uh, gives rise to severe deactivation. Well, we, one of the things we found uh, early on in our EFRC was that uh, um, we were concentrating on uh, making nanoparticles, and we found quickly that nanoparticles are easy to make, they're hard to keep around. Okay, the liquid high temperature water will abrade those materials and turn those into uh, basically mush. We'd like to control, uh, along with that, we would like to control the particle size and morphology, and uh, actually once we control those particles, we want to keep those uh, particles around uh, during these uh, conditions. And we want to control the interactions between the metal and the support. Uh, the support we consider to be just another uh, ligand, okay, uh, with uh, this thing. And uh, can we, ch uh, by changing the nature of that uh, ligand, change the uh, selectivity and stability of uh, the catalyst there? So, uh, be, uh, 
want to introduce a synthetic tool that uh, we've been using uh, in uh, our groups uh, for a number of years now. It's called atomic layer deposition. Uh, atomic layer deposition is uh, primarily just a specialized form of uh, chemical vapor deposition. But the chem uh, in the atomic layer deposition, we decouple the deposition and the decomposition step uh, uh, from each other to uh, get greater control on the surface of the catalyst. When you start with the uh, hydroxylated surface, such as uh, silica, alumina, uh, you, you uh, start off with uh, large quantities of uh, hydroxyl groups on the surface catalyst, depending on the conditions you uh, treat those on. If we then add to that a gas phase uh, alkyl aluminum, uh, alkyl metal uh, material, such as the aluminum alkyl that you see here, those will interact with the surface hydroxyls releasing one of the uh, alkyl groups and leaving the rest on the surface uh, of the catalyst. Okay. Eventually, we're going to do one of two things. We're either going to saturate uh, the material, which uh, most of the cartoons you see uh, uh, for this show, this kind of saturation. We find, for the most part, we don't get that. Okay, because the ligands that are left over are taking up so much space, we don't completely saturate. So once uh, we do that, no matter how much of the metal alkyl we add to this, uh, we end up uh, with still uh, only uh, uh, the, the uh, mono, uh, less than a monolayer of the material going on there. After that, we stop uh, feeding it in the alkyl group and start uh, doing a decomposition step. Uh, in the case of uh, TMA, what we do is feed it in the water. That then uh, releases the, uh, the rest of the alkyl groups, uh, in this case is uh, methane, and uh, generates new hydroxyl groups on the surface. Okay, and that then allows us to go through the whole series again, uh, doing another uh, layer, and so we can build up layer by layer uh, onto the surface of the catalyst, uh, whatever we're interested in. We can change those uh, uh, materials uh, partway through the synthesis uh, to uh, get mixed phases and uh, a whole uh, uh, raft of uh, other things we can do. In the case of the alumina, we grow about an angstrom at a time onto there. So uh, for uh, making something like 10 angstrom uh, onto the surface of there, we take at least uh, 10 cycles of aluminum through there. And you'll see uh, the use of the word cycles uh, uh, in, throughout the uh, talk I'm giving today, that basically is this entire uh, uh, cycle that you see uh, going on here. So, the other nice thing about uh, ALD is not a line of sight uh, pro uh, process. Okay, here you see uh, some very deep uh, wells. Okay, in which uh, the uh, 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 Aluminum, no, excuse me, this is zinc oxide uh, that is going down onto the surface of the catalyst. And you can see in the upper portion that actually even the little dimples that show up in there, uh, we uh, do line. So there are no pores that are going to be uh, uh, non-accessible to this. So we can really uh, uh, probe into the pores of things like zeolites, uh, deep uh, into uh, large particles, uh, et cetera. So it coats everything. Uh, within the Energy Frontier Research Center, we had a lot of uh, interest for uh, ALD. Uh, we were using it, for example, to make isolated metals on the, on the surface of the catalysts, and we've uh, presented some papers uh, on that. We're very interested in making uh, both bimetallics and alloy materials. Uh, alloys are relatively easy to make. Okay, Bimetal uh, Bimetallic core shell materials are sometimes more difficult. And we've been able to uh, develop techniques in which we can change which is the core and which is the shell for, uh, for those materials. And it makes a, a whole lot of difference uh, which is on the inside and which is on the outside, as we've seen from papers uh, here this uh, week here. We can also control the nature of the support okay, by putting down other layers uh, on top of that, either layers that completely cover uh, the, the blue that you see here or layers that interact very uh, 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 carefully with that. So we can introduce specific acidity or uh, sites and things like that there. Uh, we are also uh, did some uh, work on what we call nanobowls. Okay, uh, everything now needs to be nano, and uh, by nano we're not just talking about the budgets that DOE is putting out uh, here. So, but uh, nano bowls were an idea in which we were able to control the uh, pillars around uh, the metals and therefore control the, uh, uh, the access to those. 
But what I'm going to talk about uh, the, this morning in the talk is what we call uh, overcoating of these materials, in which we've uh, actually put uh, uh, various components such as aluminum oxide over the top of the metals, okay, to uh, form new pores on there and control the uh, uh, interaction with uh, the, uh, the, the surface of the catalyst. Uh, the uh, the overcoating uh, is basically a uh, uh, the next step beyond what uh, I just uh, talk, talked about. You can see in the first portion there we can uh, make palladium particles, for example, on the surface of aluminum. Overcoat those with aluminum, but when we uh, then uh, calcine those materials, we actually form new pores uh, into uh, uh, the uh, the catalyst. Okay, and those can uh, lead to some uh, uh, improvements uh, uh, or changes at least in uh, the selectivity of the catalyst of those materials. Uh, one of the reactions we're interested in uh, for biomass processing, which has been uh, highlighted in many talks uh, here this uh, week, is uh, the reaction of perforel to perforel alcohol, uh, which is just a hop, skip, and a jump uh, uh, to levulinic acid, okay, which is an important intermediate for uh, fuels formation there. Uh, we can form per perforel, uh, we can react perforel uh, to uh, various components uh, such as uh, perforel alcohol, which is our preferred product shown in the, uh, the, the left here, and, uh, or if we uh, uh, concentrate on more palladium catalyst, uh, we'll uh, decarbonylate that material to go to furan as the product. We're very interested in um, uh, improving the selectivity uh, to the perforel alcohol in uh, this uh, material here. So. Uh, for those of you who saw our paper uh, yesterday, okay, we've, uh, I won't repeat uh, all the results here, but we've been able to use, use uh, ALD overcoating, improve the uh, select, uh, change the selectivity or, uh, for the palladium hydrogenation of uh, the furfural alcohol. Uh, if we use uh, palladium by itself, which has a lot of edge and corner uh, sites on there, uh, we form a, uh, a lot of the, uh, the alcohol uh, without cleaving that carb uh, carbonyl bond. Okay, by putting in uh, the ALD overcoating, that uh, ALD overcoating uh, for alumina in this case uh, goes specifically, uh, uh, primarily to uh, edge and corner sites, leaving terrace sites open and giving rise to higher concentrations of uh, the furan uh, products that you see on the, the, the right there. So. The uh, uh, catalyst I'm going to be talking about uh, here the, uh, this, in this morning's talk is a copper chromite catalyst. Uh, it's a commercial catalyst that uh, comes from BASF. Uh, the concentrations are shown here, relatively low surface areas, and it's quite selective uh, for the reaction of uh, furfural to furfural uh, alcohol uh, from there. So. Uh, the uh, reactivity uh, for the, the catalyst as received is shown here, okay, and the important thing uh, to point out is uh, the severe deactivation with just a small amount of uh, time on stream that we uh, see here. We've investigated this uh, uh, extensively uh, in the past, okay, and have shown that uh, the deactivation is uh, due to two components that are going on on the catalyst. First of all, we see that uh, some of the chromium doesn't stay put where it is. It tends to creep over the catalyst, and we see actually the formation of a lot of uh, copper chromite on the external uh, surface area, not touching the uh, chromium oxide. In addition, uh, the little uh, squiggles you see here are uh, carbon deposits that build up on this uh, catalyst over a long period of time. So the goal of uh, uh, the, this group in IAC was uh, to find other ways of stabilizing uh, these uh, particles uh, for uh, uh, to decrease the amount of deactivation on there. As I said, what uh, we've uh, discovered is that uh, ALD overcoating uh, can help a lot in both the selectivity and the stability of this, these catalysts. We actually kind of stumbled across this, I'll be uh, honest with you, that uh, we were looking to see when, as we put aluminum over the top of metals, when would we lose communication uh, with that metal. And we found that out published on that. But what we didn't expect is that uh, if we calcine these materials at high temperatures, we would generate these new pores uh, down to the surface of the catalyst, uh, which would uh, uh, still remain the metal to be active. Uh, Peter Stair uh, was the one who first discovered this, 
Okay, and they found out that uh, not only was the catalyst uh, more selective for uh, oxidative dehydrogenation of uh, things like uh, uh, propane, okay, getting, uh, uh, excuse me, ethane to ethylene instead of CO2. The catalyst also was very uh, resistant uh, to sintering or in coking on that material. As an example, uh, the, uh, the catalyst uh, A there, uh, which is just a, a bare palladium catalyst, uh, actually plugged up the reactor in about uh, less than 15 minutes uh, at uh, 675 degrees C. Uh, the catalyst kept right on going when we did the overcoating of the, these materials uh, for that. And as you can see from uh, the uh, bar in the far uh, lower left-hand corner there, uh, the catalyst uh, without the overcoating uh, under used conditions uh, is uh, severely sintered and we get a lot larger particles of palladium uh, on the surface of the uh, catalyst. So basically we are using uh, this overcoating for uh, both cattle selectivity and deactivation and a number of other things that you uh, see listed uh, on that uh, chart right there. Uh, everybody needs to show some uh, pictures of their kids uh, whenever they uh, get onto a plane. So these are our kids here. Uh, here's a uh, just uh, a zero cycles of alumina on uh, uh, the palladium on the alumina. You can see the individual particles uh, right here. Okay, as we start uh, ad adding five cycles of alumina, you can uh, uh, start to see the formation of the alumina overcoat uh, going over the top of the palladium particle, not changing the size of that. Okay, and as we increase that, we just increase the, uh, the, uh, the thickness of that layer. And what we find is there is a linear increase in the uh, aluminum uh, overcoating as we go through additional uh, ALD uh, cycles of uh, this material. We're not limited just to alumina uh, for these materials. Uh, here you see some pictures of uh, alumina uh, going over zirconia oxide uh, materials. Okay, and you can see uh, in the uh, lower right-hand corner uh, the, uh, the zirconia uh, material in the center, and this is aluminum on the outside. Okay, and again, uh, as we treat these uh, materials in uh, steam or high temperature liquid water, uh, we uh, retain the size of uh, the metal nanoparticles that we've worked so hard to uh, attain. Here's titania going over zirconium oxide, some more pictures again, and again you can see the, uh, the zirconium oxide in the middle, and whoops, and uh, the thin layer of uh, titania going on uh, outside. There's four nanometers of TiO2 uh, on there. So we can control the amount of materials going on there by just the number of cycles that we put, put in there and uh, the way that we uh, treat those uh, materials. So we uh, went in and started looking at uh, uh, ways to improve the uh, selectivity and uh, stability of the copper catalyst here. Uh, I'll draw your attention to uh, the, the, the upper portion of this, uh, the open circles here. Okay, the, uh, the blue uh, line there with the, uh, I guess those are squares there, uh, is the, uh, uh, the, the catalyst uh, without any overcoating. Uh, when we first put in a reactor, this was work uh, that was originally uh, done at uh, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, uh, one of our partners uh, in the, uh, uh, the uh, EFRC uh, program there, and they saw the deactivation that you see uh, going on uh, in the, the uh, top portion here. When it got to a certain uh, time on stream, the material was regenerated and generated a new curve, which you see in the red here. Okay, you can see that uh, we do get, gain most of the uh, activity back, but it has dropped down uh, considerably uh, in uh, activity. Whoops. And uh, finally, uh, if we get some additional buttons here to touch. Uh, so it, it, uh, the red that then can be regenerated again, generating the green curve, okay, which is again, uh, 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 we've regenerated the uh, catalyst activity, but it's lower than the original initial activity. And this is due to, again, the, uh, the centering and the movement of uh, uh, material over the top of uh, the catalyst. 
When we do 20 cycles of alumina ALD overcoating, okay, you can see there are uh, three different uh, colors of uh, uh, symbols in there. And every time we regenerate the catalyst, we go back to the same uh, uh, component there. So, but the important thing is, is uh, uh, in addition to this, even though we can keep the stability of the metal particle here, the at low overall activity of this material is lower than uh, the uh, material that we see up above here. So uh, the stability of the uh, metal particle is increased uh, uh, dramatically here, okay, but there is a loss in general activity uh, for this catalyst. Okay, and I can tell you that that is due to the uh, strong interaction of the alumina phase uh, with the copper to form a copper aluminate uh, phase, which is uh, less active than the copper by itself here. And that's what I'm saying here. So uh, when we put uh, aluminum over the top of uh, the copper, we form the, uh, this copper aluminum aluminate phase, okay, which is less active uh, than the copper by itself. What I'm going to be showing you here is we can replace the alumina overcoating with titania, okay, and the uh, it does not copper does not form as a, a strong titanate onto the surface here, which uh, basically it uh, can form that uh, cage over the material, okay, without uh, changing the uh, the chemical nature of the copper that uh, is interested in there. So. Here's a comparison of uh, some of the things that we find, uh, comparing 40 cycle, uh, zero cycles in blue, 40 cycles of titania in red, and 45 cycles of uh, alumina overcoating onto this uh, copper catalyst uh, uh, in, uh, in black here, okay? And what you see is that uh, as we go from uh, no, no uh, uh, material uh, overcoating to 40 cycles, we do lose some of the uh, porosity of the material. You would expect that, okay? But uh, the alumina uh, phase uh, uh, dramatically uh, uh, decreases the total amount of uh, surface area and uh, the average pore size uh, that's uh, going on for this material here. Uh, everything seems to end up as an X uh, an X-ray absorption. Uh, uh, experiment uh, at Argonne National Lab. I uh, don't try to assume that everybody knows uh, about uh, uh, XAS, which is a combination of Zanes and uh, XAFs here, so let me give you a, a, a quick tutorial in this. Okay, uh, basically when we uh, hit the a central atom uh, with uh, uh, an X-ray, a high energy X-ray, we kick out a photoelectron that can interact with uh, the neighboring atoms to tell us uh, many things about what's going on in the surface of the catalyst. The far uh, left portion of uh, the spectrum is called the Zanes, okay, and that tells us a lot about the type of the central atom, the amount that's there, and the oxidation state. That third component is what we're mostly interested in in a Zanes experiment and monitoring how the oxidation state of uh, the metal is uh, changed. The little wiggly uh, lines off to uh, the far right there, okay, is what's called the uh, XAFS uh, uh, portion, EXAFS, okay, which tells the type of the neighboring atoms on there, the ligands that are associated with it, the distance to those uh, various atoms, Okay, and then finally the number of the uh, neighboring atoms that we uh, have on there. So, uh, with a single uh, XAS experiment, uh, which is the combination of Zanes and XAFs, uh, we can uh, gain an incredible amount of knowledge about the uh, uh, material. We've worked over the number of years uh, to develop cells and techniques uh, to re really work on these catalysts under realistic conditions, high temperature, high pressures, uh, and uh, reacting gases from that and we use it uh, extensively there. One of our uh, standard tools uh, for studying catalysts, of course, is uh, temperature program reduction. And there have been many talks that have used that uh, in the past. If we look at the TPR of uh, the uh, copper chromite uh, uh, catalyst shown in blue here and the uh, aluminum ALD uh, overcoated uh, copper chromite uh, catalyst shown in red, okay, the first thing you can see is that the fact that uh, there's a dramatic change in the uh, temperature program reduction uh, of uh, the copper uh, material here. And I emphasize uh, the, the copper material here uh, that we're talking about in the actuality, in a uh, this type of TPR experiment, all you know is that there's a change in the composition of uh, the gases that are coming off here. Okay, and I'll show why that's important in just a second here. 
If we look at uh, the material which we do titania overcoating, though, okay, you can see that uh, all three curves uh, overlap with each other. Uh, what you see there again is uh, the copper chromide by itself, shown in uh, in um, whatever color that is. I guess it's blue. Okay, and the uh, uh, either 20 or 40 cycles of uh, titanium oxide. We haven't changed the redox chemistry of uh, the uh, uh, the copper that we're interested in by doing the titanium overcoating. So as you might expect, and I'm foreshadowing a little bit, uh, the titanium is a far better overcoat for uh, copper material. Now I said that uh, the problem with standard TPR is uh, you really are not looking at the metal, okay, so you're making some speculation about it. When we do the same experiment uh, in the beam line, we're specifically looking just at the copper that we're interested in. So I've shown you now the Zane's portion of uh, the uh, uh, experiment, and what we do is we uh, uh, ramp the material up in uh, flowing hydrogen. Okay, uh, in uh, section C there, you see the copper chromite uh, material, and in D, and uh, it should have been E there, uh, is uh, the one in which we've uh, done 45, uh, 40 cycles of titania in the middle and 45 cycles of alumina. You can see by the Zane uh, spectrum here that uh, the, uh, uh, the redox chemistry is exactly the same for the copper chromite, the fresh copper chromite catalyst and uh, the one that's got those 45 cycles of titania over it. But uh, there's definitely a, a dramatic change in the Zane spectrum as a function of uh, temperature there. I didn't point out that uh, the, uh, uh, the y-axis uh, there is the temperature of the catalyst going from uh, right to left there. Uh, so probably can't read it from the very back at, at all. So. Uh, the pictures uh, do uh, uh, tell a little bit of the story, but uh, the nice thing about this is we can actually quantify uh, the amount of uh, uh, various components here. And what you see here is a, a plot of uh, the uh, analysis uh, from the Zane spectra that I just showed you there. The, uh, here we uh, can see the amount of uh, copper uh, zero. I'm trying to figure out which is the colors here. Copper uh, zero, which is in uh, black. Uh, copper 2 is in uh, blue and copper 1 is in uh, red, okay, and as you see that uh, as we uh, reduce the uh, catalyst going from uh, uh, room temperature to, uh, I think this went up to uh, 600 degrees here. Oh, no, excuse me, I'm uh, sorry, I should read the top here. This, th this is the oxidation uh, chemistry uh, going on here uh, uh, for this uh, at uh, 150 degrees. And you can see that uh, the copper chromite uh, one in the upper left-hand corner uh, is identical to uh, the, volt, the bottom two uh, curves in which we see the, the change in the amount of uh, copper oxide uh, showing up on these materials here. We can also, as I said, uh, quantitate uh, on the, uh, the TPR spectrum that we see here. And this is the quantitation that I, was, I thought I was talking about uh, in the previous slide. I should look at my slides, huh? Um, but uh, what you see is, if you look at the blue curve, uh, that's the oxidation, uh, the reduction, excuse me, of copper two in blue, uh, which is nearly 100% uh, at uh, room temperature, going down to uh, essentially zero uh, concentration, and almost all of it uh, going uh, to copper zero uh, at the, uh, uh, the temperatures above uh, 200 degrees here. So. If you look at now comparing that uh, to the red curve, which is 40 cycles of TiO2, uh, uh, you can see that those curves lie almost on top of each other. Okay, so the reduction potential uh, for the copper material uh, with the titanium overcoating is remaining exactly the same. Okay, so we haven't lost uh, the, uh, the effective copper material that we're gaining here. We're just uh, gaining some stability from that. Uh, to uh, the converse of that, of course, is the black curve, which is the uh, the aluminum oxide overcoated material, and you can see that uh, that uh, reduces at a far higher temperature, which is what we had seen in the standard TPR. Okay, but this actually shows us exactly what's going on with uh, uh, those uh, particular metals there. We can also look at uh, the XFs, which talks about the bonding of uh, those materials, and uh, this is a. Uh, a uh, 
air oxidation at 150 degrees, basically the uh, XF portion of the Zanes I showed two slides ago. And you can see as a function of uh, the oxidation time going on here in the copper chromite, we go from originally uh, primarily a copper, uh, 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 copper metal material to a copper oxide, shown, I'll get the arrow up here, there we go. Uh, copper metal here, copper oxide here. Okay, so eventually we uh, completely oxidize these materials. Uh, we end up with the very same type of uh, spectro for the uh, material using titania as the overcoat. Okay, but the alumina overcoat uh, ends up with about a 50-50 mixture of copper me uh, metal and copper oxide under uh, these types of conditions. So again, the, uh, the aluminum overcoating is changing the redox chemistry of the copper, whereas the titania is protecting the copper without uh, changing the redox chemistry, which is important to the, this catalytic reaction. So bottom line is, what does it do to the uh, catalytic uh, reaction here? Uh, in black uh, on the left, you see the uh, um, deactivation of the copper chromite that we talked about uh, there before. Uh, we lose about 80% uh, of uh, the activity in about the first uh, uh, 200 minutes on stream. Okay, you're doing two, 20 cycles of uh, titania. However, we don't see that deactivation. We see the red curve, uh, which is a lot more active and uh, a lot more stable uh, for time on stream. And as I, uh, the other thing I haven't shown here is this catalyst is very easily regenerated uh, under these conditions. The catalyst is extremely uh, selective, okay, showing uh, very high selectivity to the furfural alcohol. So again, we haven't messed up the copper, okay, we've just protected the copper and uh, uh, made it uh, more accessible for this, uh, the reaction that we're interested in. So in conclusion, uh, I've uh, shown that the deactivation of uh, 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 copper hydrogenation is a real problem. We see a, a, a number of things going on. Centering of the metal is uh, very important, especially in high temperature liquid water. Uh, and we also see a coking gun uh, going on there. ALD overcoating, as we've seen in many cases, uh, can protect uh, the, those metals, but you gotta be careful as to the types of uh, overcoatings you use. Alumina appears to be very good for uh, uh, the noble metals such as platinum and palladium, okay, but it really uh, messes up the activities uh, of uh, the copper material. Titania is very good for protecting uh, copper, and we've used it also in cobalt nickel uh, catalyst, okay. Uh, and one thing I didn't point out is we've got some control over the, uh, the size of the pores and uh, the depth of those pores by controlling the number of cycles and the temperature of the calcination. Okay, and uh, we're uh, using this uh, to uh, uh, change the, the nature of the uh, uh, overcoating and uh, use it hopefully to our uh, advantage there. Some of the things we're think, uh, working on right now is uh, tailoring uh, the environment uh, going into and out of the catalyst. This is uh, similar to uh, what people do, for example, with zeolites, uh, changing the nature of the, the zeolite here. We can uh, put in a bifunctional layer shown by the green there. Uh, we can put either a hydrophobic or hydrophilic uh, uh, layer over the top of these by changing the, the type of uh, ALD overcoatings that we're uh, putting in here, as long as it doesn't mess up the, the metal. And we can actually add in various types of hydrocarbons into the system uh, to change the diffusion of the uh, uh, material going in there uh, as a function of uh, time on stream there. One of the exciting things we've uh, done recently is uh, uh, to do uh, overcoating on uh, very unstable types of material. What you see here is uh, some uh, work we did on the overcoating of uh, uh, the uh, mesophorus uh, molecular sieve, SBA-15, which has been known for a, a long time, uh, but it uh, is very unstable there. You hit it with uh, steam or liquid water, uh, you lose most of the surface area of, of this material due to collapse of the pores. We found that by just putting uh, just a few layers of niobia inside of the, uh, the, that material, okay, we can encode, uh, 
coat both the inside and the outside of the particle, okay, and then we uh, put the same material in boiling water and uh, retained almost, uh, I think it was something like 85-90% uh, of the total surface area there. And what you can see in the lower uh, right hand corner there is a TEM of uh, uh, using this material for supporting uh, platinum uh, particles here. And this is uh, the, a picture of uh, that after uh, reaction conditions and the pores remain the same there and we've got a, a patent that just was issued uh, for this uh, type of material here. So, I'm going to finish up my last uh, couple of minutes here uh, talking about a new uh, system that we're, uh, uh, we just uh, started using here. It's uh, actually part of a uh, uh, poster that we presented last night and it will also be highlighted on a poster that's, coming, uh, that's on there tonight. If you're interested in, uh, this is a new uh, unit we're, which we're calling our high throughput ALD tool. Okay, uh, it combines both ALD synthesis uh, and uh, gas phase uh, catalytic testing. Okay, uh, for that we can use as many as 12 different uh, uh, precursors of ALD. So uh, you name it, we can put it down there if we can get it into the gas phase there. And it also uh, is a plug flow reactor uh, for uh, doing catalyst testing at the same time there. The system is, uh, looks like this here, that uh, over in the right hand side, we've got two parallel plug flow reactors uh, that we use here. And the way this, is, uh, this works is uh, one reactor will be doing ALD, okay, while the other reactor will be uh, doing catalyst testing of the material that we've made uh, previously. When uh, those two experiments are uh, done, we'll reverse what the, each reactor is doing. Okay, so there's some productivity improvements there. That's why we try to call it a uh, high throughput. But more importantly, is the ALD uh, material that we've made here never sees the uh, the open air uh, of uh, the laboratory uh, before we actually do the catalytic testing. So we were actually seeing the activity of the catalyst as a function of time on street. We've got uh, shown here the manifold that we've got here. As I said, we've got uh, uh, up to a dozen uh, metal precursors we can put in here. Okay, we can control whether we uh, do the decomposition using oxidizing or reducing the conditions. And we've got a whole series of different uh, gas phase feeds, such as uh, uh, ethane, ethylene, propane, propylene, that will do uh, catalyst uh, testing on these for reactors. This is just a little uh, picture of that. Uh, I'm sure many of you uh, saw our poster last night on this there. And then finally, I'd like to point out that uh, we just uh, wrote a very nice uh, uh, review paper. Okay, It actually uh, was mostly written by uh, uh, one of our uh, colleagues up at uh, Wisconsin, Brandon O'Neill, uh, that uh, basically summarizes what we're doing nowadays and what has been done so far with uh, atomic layer deposition. So if you're interested in this field, I uh, encourage you to take a look at that paper. Finally, uh, IAC uh, was a collaboration of uh, four uh, institutions, Argonne National Lab, Purdue, uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, and uh, Northwestern, uh, and I forgot to put Brookhaven National Lab uh, in there. But uh, some of the people that worked on this and other projects are uh, listed in here. Uh, it was a 55-member uh, team, so I couldn't put everybody on there. With that, I'll thank you and open to questions. Thank you. For questions. Two questions, kind of in the beginning, from the beginning, and then from later on. Have you ever thought of the fact that, you, that some of these things, like chromium in particular, titania, and also alumina, can become active themselves as hydrogenation catalysts? And you seem to totally leave that out of your consideration entirely. The last thing was the, the putting down the SBA-15. Do you have the microporosity there or not? Remember, SBA-15 is a biporous system. It has mesoporosity, but also has microporosity. And I'm wondering whether that microporosity is still there or not. Uh, to address the first question first, I don't remember. Okay, I, I, I do know we retain some of the microporosity, uh, but I uh, can't give you an exact number as to how much of that. Uh, primarily, we, uh, we lost uh, maybe something like 10% of the total surface area of the material uh, by that. Okay, but uh, what we don't see is uh, the massive loss of uh, crystallinity that you normally see for that material. 
service area gets a little bit funky when you have a micro mesoporous material. Oh yeah. So the word, and that's why when you mentioned that, but I thought maybe what you've done is you have not retained the microbrush to give you a false surface area. Mm -hmm. Right, but uh, what we do see though is uh, the mesophores uh, do remain intact. If you look at uh, the mesophores after, uh, without uh, overcoating, okay, in TEM for example, they are completely collapsed. Okay, whereas if you look at the mesophores uh, uh, in TEM after just uh, the, the coatings, okay, you see that those uh, remain intact uh, for that. Okay, and we can actually see the layers of niobia building up inside the pores. Again, as I pointed out, one of the nice things about ALD is the fact that it gets everywhere. And one of the bad parts about it is it gets everywhere. <laughs> so sometimes you can do what you're uh, alluding to, uh, uh, close off those uh, microphones. My guess is that uh, looking, if I went back and looked at the data, which I uh, can't remember right now, okay, as we did more coding on there, we probably plugged off all the micropores uh, from that. So that might be where you lose the activity, where the thing falls apart. Probably could be that way. Okay. We're going to need to go on with the program. Thank you uh, very much for the presentation.